Welcome to Prog Rock Digital. Hi everyone and welcome back to another episode of Prog Rock Digital. This is episode 6 of season 2. Thank you very much for downloading and streaming. Thank you for visiting progrockdigital.com. Now today I'm chatting with John W. Crawford, the visionary, the executive producer behind Voice in the Light by the band Amarin's Plight. Now this album was originally released in 2007. It is now being re-released July 30th, out through Lone Wolf Music. Enjoy the episode. Open to fire. Paris of Troy, out through Ludos Records, their debut single, Torn Away. True inside. Australian prog at its best, available for download and stream on all digital platforms. Hello, this is Mick Box of Your Eye Heap, and you're listening to Prog Rock Digital. The man behind some of the most iconic pieces of art connected to some of the biggest names in rock, Ioannis. Originally from Athens, Greece, in the last 36 years has created over 300 record covers for such clients as King Crimson, Fate's Warning, Uriah Heap, Allman Brothers, Blue Oyster Cult, Leonard Skinner, Ingve Malmsteen, Deep Purple, Styx, just to name a few. Be sure to connect with Ioannis at www.dangerousage.com. John. Welcome to Prog Rock Digital. Thanks for coming on. How's it going? Good day, Nick. I am doing great. <laughs> How are things in um, Pennsylvania, man? I am in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Amish country, of course, in the USA. And uh, it's summertime here. And um, we're excited with uh, um, some some new things something kind of that's old but but new we're going to be doing and um yeah i appreciate having you being on the show well man look you've um you're the the brains behind amarin's plight voice in the light you put the band together you finance the project tell us a bit about it and obviously you're here for one thing and that is you're spruiking the fact that you're re-releasing voice in the light out through Lone Wolf Music, through your own label, of course. Tell us a bit about it. Tell us a bit about the process. Originally released this album in 2007. Why now? And yeah, just run us through the process. Um, wow. Um, we'll have to do this over several podcasts, actually. But uh, <laughs> um, to say that I'm the brains behind it, it might not be quite um, as accurate uh, a statement um i was i am the i i'm the primary story writer and uh lyricist but um mm -hmm. gary Werecamp is the musical mind behind it and um yes. so um him and i both have i guess um we're half half brains that came together with this but um, the short story is that um, this year is the 20th anniversary of me writing the story and the lyrics in such a way that it formed um, the beginning stages of a concept album um, that, was, that took place in the winter of 2000. And um, it was supposed to be re-released last year, but COVID um kind of screwed us up and we decided to push it off um another year um so um here we are um uh, you know it is the 20th anniversary of when it was written by me um lyrically and the storyline not musically i am musically illiterate although i had directions and ideas for the songs gary mm -hmm. wrote um, all the music and DC Cooper along with Gary wrote the vocal melodies 
most of the vocal melodies were written by DC Cooper. And that took place between 2001 and 2006 over the course of several years. Of course, the project was released in 2007 on Prog Rock Records. And um, that contract was up after five years. And now we feel it's um, right to re-release it. And I'm going to be re-releasing it through my own small little record label uh, and production company. And this now will lead me to my next question. You seem to have your hands or fingers in, in a lot of pies. I mean, you're obviously um, you know, a photographer, you're an author, you own your own label, um, you know, and, and various other businesses. I mean, you're never short of, of ideas and, and inspiration. Tell us how and why Voice in the Light came about. Well, when I wrote Voice in the Light, um, I had just started dabbling with video, um, very boring stuff, nuisance wildlife control stuff and uh, tractor commercials. Um, but I had big dreams of writing stories and uh, movies and related. So um, I was going through a difficult time in the uh, fall of 2000, in the winter of 2001. And uh, I'm not sure why, but one day I was thinking about um, a story that someone had told me about a man that was dying of cancer and had told his wife and his best friend that they should get together after he passes. And that sort of mm -hmm. um, was the catalyst for, and it was a, it was some, somewhat of a true story. The guy's name was Ronnie Swinehart, and he did pass away. Story isn't it's quite as accurate as I heard through the grapevine, but um, it just kind of started to grow, and I had two or three song ideas. It's just you know all projects are puzzles. You put the pieces of the puzzle together, and then you have a final picture. Um, so it started off as song titles and ideas for each one, and then just kind of grew from there. So what was it like working with uh, our good friend Gary Workamp? Total, total gentleman, amazing musician, and then obviously working with, uh, you know, DC Cooper and, and Nick DiVigilio. And obviously you had um, our good old friend, Mr. Barabbas on bass. Uh, yeah, run us through that. I mean, that, that would have been inspiring in itself, just being in the studio while these guys were laying down their tracks and, you know, acquainting themselves with your lyrics, Gary's music, and just putting everything together. Um, what was the feeling like in the studio? Well, um, I wish I could say that it was, you know, like the guys from Led Zeppelin locking themselves into Headley Grange for a year. <laughs> um, those days are long gone. Um, how it really came to pass was uh, Gary and I met. Um, I had contacted Gary through the Shadow Gallery um, fan club. And, and if I can just interject there, John, sorry for, for a sec there. Gary um, actually told us this story. I had him on the show uh, a few episodes back, or actually probably about four or five episodes back. So, yeah, please touch on it again because it is interesting and it, it, um, you know, it definitely puts forward the fact that, um, you know, uh, if you've got an idea in your head, keep pushing. So, yeah, go for it. Yeah, so we're going to give you the Crawford version. Where yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure... You know, the, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle, but uh, the, 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 how it started was uh, I had finished the thing and I had big dreams and it was in the spring of 2001. I put ads in the Metal Edge magazine and in the back of the Metal Edge magazine were fan club uh, addresses. So I mm -hmm. had a, a friend of mine at her job draw up this press package on her computer or during her lunch break because I didn't have a computer at the time. I didn't even have to do yep. email. This is spring of 2001. <laughs> and um, I sent out all these these press packages. 
and I was a huge fan of Shadow Gallery, so I sent one to theirs, and I got no response. And so I sent a second one, and I think possibly a third. But what I also did was, in the back of the CD booklet, was a, the thank yous, um, one mm -hmm. of which was a record store in near where Gary Werekamp and them were from, which Gary's only about an hour and a half from me. And um, I called this this store and asked for this guy that was thanked in the back of the, I think his name was Josh. And, uh, and he came to the phone and I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm writing this, this masterpiece and I'd like to speak to Gary Werekamp about renting his studio. Can you put me in contact with him? This is John Crawford from Lone Wolf. And of course, I'm in my little house, you know, with big dreams, and that's about all I have. <laughs> and uh, so it's by chance that I believe Gary had just gone to the Shadow Gallery fan club mailbox and saw my my um, press package again and a note in yeah. there, and then went to see Josh at the record store. And Josh said, "Hey, there's some guy that Carl contacted named John Crawford." So I get, Gary said, well, I guess this guy is pretty serious. So he called. I came home from, from work, and there was a message on the machine from Gary. And I couldn't believe it because I was a fan. Uh, so I called back, and, and then he never called me back for three weeks. And I thought, you know, every time the phone rang, I thought, oh, is it him, you know? But lo and behold, he did call back, and we talked, and he liked it. And about two weeks after that, or a month after that, I was sitting in his studio um, giving him my pitch. And he agreed to do it. And he agreed to let me um, use his, um, basically his name that he was attached to it to get other musicians. And that's when I reached out to DC Cooper. Paint the picture for us if you can, just a, a, a few hours in the studio or a day in the studio with, I mean, were they, in the room together at the same time or was it you know a bit of bit of both or how, how does that work or how did it work dc cooper agreed to do it i sent him a press package he responded two weeks later and the first thing he said to me is after we do this record you need to do the movie or the play because it's standing prepare to learn how to write um movie scripts and um so we then waited for Gary to come up with a few demos. Now, I financed this, so I did not have any money coming in for this project till about February or March of 2001. But in January, I contacted Gary, and he was so inspired by the first two songs that he had already um, started working on them. So I went up to his studio in January and sat down in his studio and listened to what he had started, which was one of the most amazing moments of it, because then there was a song attached to these lyrics and song ideas. Um, I had musical directions of tempo, speed, uh, you know, um, vibe, and, and even down to, you know, hey, let's have a Def Leppard style, you know, acoustic guitar at the beginning. Um, and I didn't even know the jargon, you know, I just, I just know good music. And, um, so once that was done and then money came into play and was paid to the musicians, DC Cooper came to Gary's studio for a day and a half or two days. And we laid down vocals for, uh, those two songs and many of those vocals are actually used on the final recording uh, because they were so strong. And um, so, uh, but it was really cool to be able to sit there with, you know, these guys that I had, you know, I watched DC Cooper, you know, live from Japan and I was, I was a huge fan. And I had gone to see him as well um, sometime that fall and um, had a, had a, had a really good conversation. I mean, I had conversation with him about coming on board and finances and so forth and so on. So everything uh, everything felt really good. They were really excited about it. I was excited about it. 
um, they sat me down and they said, how much do you love your lyrics? And I said, you know, I love them. I wrote them. And basically they said, it's a good start, but it's not, it's, it's, it's not your best. We need, Gary said to me, we need for you to learn how to write lyrics like Robert Plant or Roger Waters. And that can start right now. And I was, for a second, I was a little bit offended, but then I was like, no, they're right. This is a good start. And they know what they're talking about. You trust experts and they're experts. And um, so it was learning experience as well. However, I will say some of the songs, 80 or 90% of the lyrics were actually um, used as they were written um, by me in the first place. Coming July 30th, the re-release of Amarin's Plight, Voice in the Light, featuring Gary Workamp, DC Cooper, and Nick DiVigilio. One of the greatest progressive conceptual albums of the 2000s is with us once again. www.amarinsplight.net Out through Lone Wolf Music. Obviously, we've got a concept. We have music. We have the recording situation studio. We have, once the recording came to fruition and it was ready and and ready for release, um, where did it go from there? Well, there was a period of time in the middle, somewhere between 2004 and 2005, that I just flat out ran out of money. The truth is that um, Inside Out Music had interest in it Um, because they were interested in Gary and Shadow Gallery, and um, they had DC Cooper on board. Now, at the time, we did not have Nick DiVirgilio or Kurt Barabas. Um, We had been in talks with Mark Zonder, um, but that did not work out. Um, So it basically was the three of us, and Inside Out Music um, was very interested in it, but then backed out at the last minute. And that left a financial void where we stalled for about two years. Um, And we had about 70% or 80% of the album demoed by that time. DC Cooper and I had done a good bit of stuff, the demo stuff just before the money ran out on my end. And so, um, I was I had gotten gotten married and started to be a little bit responsible and had to grow up. My my dream had to go on a shelf. But then Sean Gordon from Prog Rock Records um, had uh, yeah we had we had a discussion about it and he said you know how much do you need to finish this thing and we talked about money a little bit and um, you know he said how much time I said eight or nine months and come up with the cash and we're good. And he did. He he jumped in with both feet, and um, he was able to get Nick D. Virgilio, and I think Rich Mauser, who did the mixing, and uh, also Kurt. And it just kind of all came together. Again, all projects are puzzles, um, and sometimes you lose the piece of the puzzle. It's on the floor or it's under under paper somewhere, but you find it, and you put it together, and you just keep you just keep putting it together. So, John, look, I'll, I'll have you back on the show, if you don't mind, um, in the coming well, coming episodes. Obviously, I would love to have, you know, both you and, and Gary on, on the show, if, if possible, um, or a combination of, of, of whatever. I mean, would love to have someone from Amarin Supplied on with you and, you know, for us to go through, you know, the motions. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Quickly spruik the July 30th release, if you can, or the re-release. Yeah, the re-release is going to take place on um, July July 30th. We are going to release the original version of Voice in the Light and also the Japanese release that contains a bonus track. Um, I, uh, I, myself, along with Gary and DC, own the rights to that. And so that's going to be released through us. Um, and it's going to be um, the whole entire project was always meant to be a complete experience 
So yes. I'm not sure if we're going to do a digital download right away because we want people to sit and look at the lyrics and the pictures and listen to the entire thing as a, as and people don't do that anymore. So um, that's going to be the first thing. We're all going to have also a special package where you can buy both together and there'll be uh, an additional booklet in there and perhaps um, some other goodies. Um, we're going to see a lot of Amarin's Plate and a lot of stuff about Voice and a Light in this next year. And um, yeah, I appreciate it. And um, I will hopefully try to get um, Gary freed up where we can talk. This this project was a a mammoth undertaking. We had a lot of time and great time. And and uh, there's a lot of really cool things that went on behind the scenes that, uh, that we can talk about. Fantastic, fantastic. So amaransplight.net and it's going to be out through Lone Wolf Music John Crawford thank you very much for uh, coming on the show we'll chat soon have an amazing day or night it's uh, early morning here in Melbourne Australia so we shall keep in touch and um, yeah enjoy man have a have a have an awesome uh, well awesome re-release you bet thank you very much and uh, talk to you soon <laughs>